Hey everyone, welcome to Advent of Code 2022, Day 10, Cathode Ray Tube. In this video, I'll be doing the puzzles in a quick time lapse and then fully explaining my solutions, including my code, afterwards. If you want to see my code, that's going to be in the GitHub repository, which is linked to in the description. Be sure to check that out. So let's get started with the time lapse. All right, so today's puzzles were definitely a bit more challenging. I took five minutes 37 on part one, getting ranked 132, which is pretty good. Um, but then on part two, I took a bit longer and got ranked 1477. Um, so today's, I think, was generally a bit harder, even though, you know, people did get it pretty fast. Um, let's take a look at day 10. I think um, the 100th place for both parts got it in 12 minutes, which is faster than yesterday's, I think. Yesterday um 100th place got 14th but i don't know about the distribution i think today was maybe i think today was harder um just personally anyways um let's talk about the puzzles so today we have a cathode ray tube which is being updated by a series of instructions sent to its cpu when i first saw this i was like oh no we have to do another signal based processing thing like we did for uh day six so um i was i was very scared but it turns out it wasn't that bad. So first of all, the input describes changes to a variable called x. Uh, we have uh, two types of instructions, just no op and add x. When I first saw no op, I was like, OK, this is pretty basic. It's just a do nothing instruction, and we can ignore all of it. Um, the other kind of instruction is add x, which updates the variable x by the amount described. So if it's 3, for example, we add, uh, we add 3 to x. If it's negative 5, then we subtract 5. From x. Initially, x is 1 at the beginning of the instructions. So what we have to do is calculate the signal strength at a number of uh, interesting cycle times. So what cycle times are, are first it starts at 0, and as we do the instructions, the cycle time increases. No op requires 1 cycle, add x requires 2 cycles. So the cycle time goes like this. At the beginning, it's 0. After doing no op, it's 1. After doing the first add x, it's 3. And after doing, after doing the second add x, it's 5. So it gives a bunch of instructions. Um, hopefully looking at the examples will help as well. But basically what we're asked to do is calculate the signal strength at each time. Um, the times are 20, 60, 100, 140, 180, and 220. And to calculate the signal strength, we multiply the cycle time by the value of x during that cycle. So the thing that complicates this is when we have an add x instruction that takes two cycles, but the value of x only updates after the second cycle has passed. So if we get a cycle time that's in between, um, that update, like in the middle of that update, we have to use the old value of x, and that makes things a bit more complicated. But let's take a look at my code and how I did this. So uh, to begin with, we read the inst we read the input. Um, this is pretty basic. There's only two types of commands, <clears throat> and basically we just go line by line and want to parse. So standard Python reading, split by new lines. We now, we now have a list of strings which describe each command. And now we're going to keep track of a bunch of variables which describe the state of the program as it's running. So x is going to be our variable, which starts at 1, and op is going to uh, describe the cycle time, which starts at 0. Um, and then I just have these two variables here, which are going to help us. Um, they're kind of, they're not keeping track of state, but they're just going to help us compute our answer. So interesting is the list of cycle times that we find interesting and want to find the value of x. We want to find the signal strength during, and answer is just going to contain a running tally of our answer. So we're going to go through um, all of the lines, all of the instructions, one by one, and for each instruction, we're going to split it by a space just to analyze what this instruction contains. Either it's no op or it's add x. If it's no op, then uh, when we split it by spaces, there's only going to be one element in the list. If it's no op, then we just simply increment the operation by one. Um, after that operation, if we arrive at an interesting cycle time, then we want to calculate the signal strength, which is just the operation number times the value of x. Otherwise, it's an add x command, which uh, first is going to update the value of x. So we just take a look at the second element in that list we created by splitting up the line, turn it into an integer. That's the number we need to update x by, and then we just update x by that value. At this point, I found it easier to split it up into two parts, um, the cycle update. So remember, again, add x is going to increment the cycle count by two. So first, we increment the cycle time by one. If we have arrived at an interesting um, cycle time, then what we need to do is an up update the answer by the signal strength. How we do that is we take the current cycle time, since we are at an interesting point. And to find the value of x during this cycle time, we actually need to go backwards, because the 
we need to use the old value of x um recall because the current value of x has already been updated but we don't want the new value of x we only want the old value of x and then we can just update the operation again um in truth we could probably remove these and just move this to the end um, and that'll probably still work but i found it more intuitive to do it the other way around to update x first and then retroactively add the signal strength so at the end all we need to do is just add up the signal strength uh, signal strengths we've been keeping track of it anyway um, as we've been iterating through the commands and at the end we can just print out the total so the idea here was really to go through the commands one by one instead of going through cycle time um, because it's not linear of course uh, with respect to um, line numbers or commands because add x increments cycle count by two while no up only increments it by one so i found this to be the fastest way to do it um, if you want to see my code it's going to be in the description below so be sure to check it out but um, yeah, I finished 132nd place, which is pretty fast. Um, I'm pr pretty proud of that. So this code works pretty intuitive, I think. Uh, hopefully the explanation um, did clarify how this works. Okay, now let's move on to part two. I think this is slightly more complicated. Okay, for part two, um, we get to explain how the cathode ray tube actually works. So it turns out that this tube is actually a... 40 by 6 grid so it's a screen um, and it's going to draw a picture that is six rows and 40 columns and the cpu is going to draw pixels onto this screen based on the value of x so how this works is the cathode ray tube the crt is going to draw line by line or row by row and it keeps track of a sprite as it's drawing <clears throat> so this sprite um, is initially located at x position one so this sprite is, only has an x coordinate it doesn't have a y coordinate and it's going to move back and forth several times depending on the value of x so initially x is one um, as stated in part one so the sprite is going to be located in this location as the crt draws we are going to update the position of the sprite um, and of course this has to correspond with cycle time and all of that okay so how the crt actually draws is for each line as it is iterating uh, through cycle time, it is going to look at the position of the sprites and see if it overlaps with the current horizontal position of the pixel. So it's gonna iterate from uh, cycle one to cycle 240. For each of those, it's gonna look at the current value of X during that cycle. It's gonna look at where the sprite is and if the sprite overlaps with the current horizontal position, it's going to draw a pixel there. Now overlaps just means that the position of the sprite differs by the current column by no more than one which is uh, what I have here. So um, this is pretty complicated. It took me a couple readings of the puzzle to actually understand what it was asking for, but it, all in all, it's not too complicated. At the end of that, we have a picture um, after all 240 cycles have been done and we have determined whether every pixel is on or off, then it's going to produce a picture for us and we need to extract the eight capital letters in our cathode ray tube and just implement that. Um, there was a puzzle like this last year where we had to extract like um, letters from a picture and this just makes it kind of harder to automate but it's not too bad just to extract it manually so I'm not going to bother with automate automating um, recognizing letters from this sort of ASCII art okay let's look at how I did this so for the sake of convenience I didn't do this in part one but for part two to make things a little bit more easy um, I'm going to iterate by cycle time instead of iterating by instruction so this is just going to make it easier to draw the picture since we're going to know um, a bunch more information about each pixel as we're drawing the pixels instead of having to go command by command. So I'm going to create this variable called x, which keeps track of the variable x during each cycle. So for index one, it's going to represent the value of x after cycle one. Um, index 100 is going to represent the value of x after cycle 100. How do we calculate this? Actually, this is probably pretty bad variable naming. I probably shouldn't name it x since that should be the value of x itself, but you know, whatever, I was doing this really quickly and this was the best variable that came to mind. So as usual, we do we do go through commands initially to construct this array or list. Um, what we do, basically the same thing. If it's a no op, then the value of x stays the same. We can increment our operation by one. Now that the, sorry, operation uh, keeps track of the cycle time. After we've incremented our cycle time, we're at the end and we can just say our current um, value of x at the end of this cycle time is correct. And this is all good. I do want to note, you might be complaining about some off by one stuff. Um, that's just because I initially uh, have clock cycle time to be zero and I incremented it before determining what the value of x is. It all manages, it all manages to work out somehow, um, so don't worry too much. Okay, add x command is a little bit more complicated, but it's mostly the same thing. Um, so 
op currently contains the current cycle time. We're going to increment x by this value v, but first we're going to say at the end of the next cycle time, x is still going to be the same. It's still going to be the old value. Um, and then we increment x, and then we do our actual inc increments of the cycle time. So at the end of two operations from now, um, the value of x is going to be the updated value of x, since x only updates at the end of the two cycle operation. So feel free to take a look at this code more carefully um, if you want to analyze it and see how it works. But it does work somehow, so I'm not going to touch that after I've written it and tested it. So we're going to leave that alone. OK, now we have this array x, which uh, gives us the value of x after any given cycle time. And this is going to be really helpful for drawing the picture. So to draw the picture, we're going to create this two-dimensional array, which is going to store whether each pixel is on or off for all 240 positions. Um, I, we don't need this print x here. Basically, using Python list comprehension, what I did was create um, a row, which is just 40 empty slots inside this list. So all of them are initialized to none, which is the equivalent of null, um, or like, I don't know, just like null or undefined in Python. And we're going to repeat this six times to get six rows of 40 empty slots for us to write to. So this for loop, um, you know, probably should be the other way around to facilitate intuition. Uh, basically, we're going to go through all of the rows and then go through all of the columns. For each row, we're going to iterate from column 0 to 39, and it is 0 indexed, thankfully. Um, the puzzle states that, yes, the leftmost pixel in each row is position 0. So our column is going to go from 0 to 39. So we need the current cycle time as the CRT is drawing this pixel. That is just going to be the row times 40 plus the column plus 1. So you can see here in row zero, column zero, that is going to be cycle one because it's zero times 40 plus zero plus one. And, you know, for, for any arbitrary spots in here, for example, let's look at row five, um, column 39, five times 40 plus 39 plus one is going to equal 240. So this formula, row times 40 plus column plus one is going to give us the current cycle time that the CRT is drawing um, our current pixel. I initially um, make, made a mistake here and wrote 6 instead of 40, but it's 40 because every row corresponds to an increase in um, 40 pixels. Okay, so now all we need to do is look at the current value of x, or rather the value of x during this cycle time. So we actually have to decrease our counter, um, which is really just op, but I didn't want to reuse variable names. We have to decrement it by 1 because we want to look at the old value of x um, at the cycle time, at the beginning of the cycle time, or like during this cycle time. We don't want to look at the value of x after. That's going to mess up our calculations. So again, recall that x describes the location of the sprites. If the location of the sprite is no more than 1 away, or like the center of the sprite is no more than 1 away from our current column that we're drawing, then we do want to um, turn this pixel on. And how I did that was just I assigned the value in the array um, of the picture to be two hashtags, two pound signs to make it easier to visualize. Because having one is really skinny, like the ratio of a character's width to its height um, in the font that I'm using, consulus is, you know, um, it's relatively skinny. Um, it's like a two by one ratio or something. So I decided to make it two, um, two characters just to make it easier to see. So uh, otherwise, if the current sprite position does not overlap with our current column, then we can just make the current cell empty. Um, and after that, after all of that, we have a two-dimensional array that contains our entire picture. Every row and column contains um, the characters it's supposed to to display our picture. And at the end, we can just join it all together by printing um, all the rows concatenated. So for row zero, we smush everything together inside that list of 40 items and just do that for every row. And at the end, we get a pretty cool picture um, that looks like this. So you can see that having you know a width of two really helps. And in my case, the answer is P-L-G-F-K-A-Z-G. -G. Okay, so today was a bit of a more challenging day, but I hoped um, the explanations explained something for you or helped clarify or were insightful in some way. Just hope it helped you. If you want to share your approach in the comments, I would really appreciate that. I'm interested in seeing what approaches other people took. Um, and if you want to join my private leaderboard, I'm going to include the code to that in the chat. So we currently have 47 people, um, so that's quite a lot of people. Check out the description for a code to join. And as another reminder, if you want to see my code, that's going to be in the GitHub repository, which is linked to in the description. Do be sure to check that out. It includes my code um, to previous day's puzzles as well. So that's it for day 10. I hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll see you tomorrow for day 11.